everyone. I'm Linda Nickel, and welcome to the Happiness Hour. Every week, photographers from all over the country are joining me to connect, inspire, and create with the help of a guest speaker who share their images, some of their favorite photography tips and techniques, and inspire us to improve our own photography skills. The schedule for upcoming presentations is on my website at lindanickel.com. And if you've missed some of our previous sessions, you'll find them linked to the Happiness Hour YouTube channel. My guest tonight is Texas-based wildlife and nature photographer, Ruth Hoyt. Ruth is a respected instructor and a full-time wildlife guide on private South Texas ranches. She's a frequent guest speaker at birding and wildlife festivals. She's a contributing writer to the Journal of Wildlife Photography, and her work has been exhibited in the Smithsonian, and many of her images have been published in well-respected books and magazines. If you're interested in joining her, on one of our international photography workshops, you can reach out to her on Instagram at Ruth Hoyt Photo or through her website at ruthhoyt.com. In tonight's presentation, Know Your Wildlife Subject Intimately, Ruth will share specific tips that she uses when composing photographs of birds and other wildlife. Ruth says there is more to creating a photo then focus, exposure, composition, and content. Ruth relies heavily on her knowledge of her subjects when working to create exceptional photographs, and she'll share some of her top tips with us. Welcome back to the Happiness Hour, Ruth. Thanks, Linda. It's great to be here. I don't know how many times you've been here, but you and Valerie Hoffman rival each other on the most appearances. So um, I'm happy to have you. And I kind of, I'm going to giggle because when you gave me the title, um, getting to know your subjects intimately, I was like, that doesn't sound right. And then I thought about it. I thought, no, I need to insert the word wildlife. So I did that without your permission, but I wanted to make sure <laughs> that it was, it was, it sounded right. So. We Welcome. Want to keep it clean. We're going to keep it clean. Um, what did I miss in your bio? Anything exciting? What have you been up to? You, you've said more than enough. All right. Well, all right. With that, um, I'm going to go ahead and let you have the screen. And if you don't mind, sometimes it's nice. I introduced you, but maybe just give us a one or two liner about how you got started because you've been doing this a long time. And there are a lot of new people in the room that may not know who you are or have been to South Texas. So I'd like for you to give them a little sample of, of what you do. Well, I'll just say that I've been in Texas since January of 2000, and I'm so glad I got here. I lived in uh, Missouri before that, and I've been uh, teaching photography for more than 30 years. That should say enough, I think. That's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> a long time long time All right that's okay. I did not put the word wildlife in my that's okay subject line. so I do nature landscape wildlife I'm mostly known for my birds but uh and that's what most of the subjects will be I have others in there too but I thought I'd uh, start out with that with knowing your subjects intimately I love coming on the happiness hour it's been a while and I uh, don't know she's always booked way ahead but uh, maybe I'll come back again sometime soon. Of course you will. So this is a picture of me uh, with an Audubon's Oriole. And I was on a ranch and there were no orange trees, but this bird loved oranges and he would uh, come very close. And one day I just decided to hold the orange in my hand and he came to it. And uh, I just, I started taking pictures of him with my cell phone. This is him in action. He was not one bit afraid. And later he gave me this picture. I like to trade, uh, I'm gonna say these birds work for food 
and trade food for pictures. A little uh, black crested titmouse came to the same perch. I'm just going to give you a little bit of a sampling of pictures that I've taken and um, then we'll get into the program. This is me photographing an armadillo and <laughs> it paid no attention to me whatsoever. And I was smiling because I was really laughing. It was funny. This is me. I didn't expect that one to pop up right away, but there's a snake picture. It's me in a setup photographing a, a Western diamondback rattlesnake. And you can see that I'm protected with the plexiglass with my lens poking through the uh, hole that I had made in the plexiglass. There's a Northern Cardinal taking a drink and letting a drop of water flip through the air before it landed back in. Some painted buntings. Northern Bob White. A lot of people don't have Bob Whites in their area anymore, but we still have them down here. They're wonderful. Some crested caracaras. Uh, and you can see the crest on the one on the left. And the one on the right is doing a little bit of behavioral territorial display. And it looks like they're wet, but I don't think they are. I think that was just the wind rippling their feathers. There's a toucan from Costa Rica, one of my trips there. So today uh, I've got several topics that I want to cover. And I'm not going to um, make it long and drawn out. I've got lots of pictures. Um, we're going to talk about choosing a location developing your knowledge about your subject, predicting what can happen, and composing your camera ahead of time. So we'll start with part one, choosing a location. But first, I want to highlight Linda's photograph. She has been following this woodpecker and his family for a long time now. And it's because she noticed him and started paying attention to what he was doing. And so I just thought I'd throw that in there because I, I just... I applaud Linda for her efforts. I think it's great. So first things first, she sort of mentioned it, but I always like to talk about these things. The four basics for taking great photos include focus. You got to have your picture in focus. Exposure. You got to have it just right. If it's too dark or too light, it's not going to be what you thought it was. And in this case, I'm doing backlighting. The light is coming through the um, the feathers on this roseate spoonbill. Composition, that has to do with the way that you arrange the subject or subjects within the frame. Sometimes they move and you can't control them exactly, but sometimes you can capture uh, a nice movement through the picture. You can follow the way they're looking or pointing. And content, the story. What is the story telling? In this case, we've got a female roseate, uh, start to say roseate spoonbill. In this case, we have a roseate skimmer, it's a dragonfly, and she's laying eggs. And what she does is drops her tail into the water, lays some eggs, and then flips back up out of the water. And it usually brings water drops with her. So there's a story there. Then there's an optional bonus, and I call that the wow factor. When you first see a picture on the screen or in a book or a magazine or a billboard, and you say, wow, that's the wow factor. This is a green jay that has just come up from under the water and looks like he's got a punk rock hairdo. And I, I've always loved this photo and I'm gonna talk a lot about green jays tonight. That's sort of one of my specialties down here in deep South Texas. So let's um, go on to choosing a location. Wildlife has certain needs and that does determine where they go. Those needs are water, food, shelter, and a safe place to rear their young. So let's talk about those. We've got an armadillo drinking water. They need water. Most wildlife does. There's food. You've got a green jay pecking at the cactus. This is somewhat of a shelter. It's a nest and you've got these herons on the nest uh, interacting and a safe place to rear their young. This is the male Northern Bob White, and those are three of his chicks. And he comes and scouts to make sure the area is safe while his mate hangs back in the, in the uh, deeper grasses. And when it looks like it's safe, he calls them and they all come. And with a little bit of luck, 
you can sometimes get some really nice images. This is, I do night photography and this is a raccoon at night uh, coming to the water and he's uh, washing his paws. Here you've got a fruit, uh, fruit, fruit and nectar um, bat. They come to the flowers that have the nectar and they lap up the, the nectar and the flowers. Here's one of those herons and it's making shelter by carrying sticks to the tops of the trees where you saw before. And having a place to rear their young is really important to wildlife. And you can see this doe has brought her fawn to the water. This is the first time the fawn had been to the water that we know of because it was um, very leery of getting in the water, but once it did, it started playing. But uh, here's mom reassuring the fawn. So part two is developing your knowledge about your subject. And here I'm gonna focus on green jays. Uh, you're gonna study them in person. You're gonna read about them and learn about them from others and spend time outside. So this is a typical way to observe and photograph wildlife. This is a photograph from one of the blinds at the Laguna Seca Ranch where I guide. So you can get a picture of a green jay very easily. This is just a bird sitting on a stump. It's not really um, a particularly interesting photograph. It's just a bird on a brown stump. You can get them on greenery. They turn around sometimes and pay attention to you when they hear you. Sometimes they sound off, they're very vocal. So just from watching, <clears throat> excuse me. So just from watching these few pictures, you can see that they're very interesting to watch. They like to watch us too. They're very curious and very smart. They get together in groups and they're family groups. Sometimes there are rival families and there's a little bit of action there too but uh, they love to hang out together and they find food together. They send messages and bring others. Sometimes you can get even more. This is the most, uh, this, this is the highest number of green jays I've ever gotten on one perch, five on one perch. Part three has to do with predicting what will happen. And again, we're gonna continue with this green jay uh, theme. They are very curious. They come in to inspect everything. Even if the branch or perch that you set up is really not designed for a bird that large. This is a very small branch, but he landed there and flared out his wings and tail feathers. Sometimes you'll put things meant to attract other birds and a green jay will come in. Yes, they will eat berries, but that's not their favorite food. They love to inspect what's happening before they go down to whatever you've put to attract them. They sometimes disagree with each other and uh, flare up their, their crests and fluff up their feathers. They're very curious. This one had watched a woodpecker uh, poking around under that branch. And so it went upside down just like a woodpecker to see what was there. This one's sounding off to the others to let them know that there's food today. This one's angry. You talk about angry birds. Uh, I was photographing this bird. It was just a bird on a stick until he spotted a summer tanager from uh, behind me. I couldn't see the summer tanager, but I could hear it. And this bird did not like the red bird coming into its territory. So it fluffed itself up larger than I had ever seen a green jay before. And I have a whole series of this bird doing that. This was when it maxed out the size that it could become. It held that pose for just a second and then it deflated because it couldn't hold its breath any longer. And part four comes to composing ahead of time. When you're expecting birds to do something, you need to leave room in the frame to make room for the picture. Uh, you don't want the bird to be too close to the edges. And so this one is almost too tight. I love doing birds in flight. And when you're using a long lens, you have to make sure you've left enough room for the bird to, uh, to move around in the space. And in this case, I had too long of a lens. I don't generally use zoom lenses. 
So I should have had a shorter lens. And that's one of the really important things when you're uh, getting to know your subjects intimately, you need to know how big they are and how they're going to fit in the frame. So here's another uh, action shot of a green jay coming into land. And I left more room in that picture. I used a shorter lens, but with a teleconverter. So this one fills the frame pretty much, but I also like to back off even more. Here we've got a green jay coming into a cactus and he lands very carefully. And you can see that I have composed the picture exactly the way I expect it to look. I left a little bit of room on the left side for the bird and its tail. And I left more room on the right side of the cactus so that the bird wouldn't be going out of the picture. I mean, yes, if you cut the picture in half, it, you can do that with your hand looking at the screen right now. If you put your right hand up and cover the right half of the picture, you'll see that I still have most of the cactus and all of the bird, but that's a tight, tightly composed picture. I like to leave a little bit more room than that. So this is more comfortable. If you use a zoom lens, zoom out more than you think you need because you can crop. But on the other hand, you don't want to make the bird so small in the frame that you have to crop out more than half of the picture because then you're losing pixels and quality. I've got two examples of this great uh, green jay flying to a cactus. This one, I photographed it with the camera composed horizontally, just like it is when you hold it in your hand normally. But in the next picture, you'll see that I've turned my camera on its side so that I'm doing a vertical picture. And you still get the same thing, but the picture looks completely different. If you work for publication like I do, you want to take pictures both horizontally and vertically because that leaves room for, let's say, this would be a good double page spread in the middle of the magazine. Um, but if you wanted to be on the cover of the magazine, you're going to want to do a vertical. And for the purpose of this slideshow, I've cropped some of what was on the top and the bottom just to, to fit it better um, to fill up the screen. But I did have the camera vertically. Let me, let me while you're still on that photo, Ruth, um, John has a quick question in here. Um, he's curious on focus. Do you pre-focus or auto-focus on the bird? He's... When I'm doing flight, yeah. When I'm doing flight shots like this, I pre-focus and I turn off autofocus. Well, actually I use autofocus with my thumb. I use rear focus. So once I've set my focus to exactly where I expect the bird to come, I don't use my thumb to focus anymore. If you use your finger to focus, what you do is you pre-focus on the spot, then you turn off autofocus so the lens cannot refocus and then you just photograph at that particular spot. Sometimes you'll need to make an adjustment as you go through your photo session. But when I'm doing flight photography, I dedicate myself to that particular spot with that particular focus. That ensures that I'm going to get the highest number of successful shots out of the session. If I start getting distracted with other subjects off to the side and I move my lens and, and turn on autofocus or, or focus with my thumb, I'm going to lose the focus on what I was really intending to do. I pick my um, locations, as you know, very carefully. These birds come to the water for food and water and to bathe and bring their young. And so I've already got a location chosen where I know I'm going to have good subjects. Then I decide uh, what I want to photograph that day. And a lot of it is determined by the weather. So um, if, if I've got a bright and sunny day, I know I can get a, a very fast shutter speed very easily. And I'm always tempted when I've got good light like that to do uh, flight photography. If I get super low light, I might work on more of drinking pictures or perching on pretty perches and striking poses. You'll see a lot of that in the pictures that I've brought tonight. And I say, use the shutter. Back in the film days, I would tell my students, burn film. Well, now you burn pixels by pressing that shutter and leaving it down. So let's talk about um, one of the habits of the Green Jays. They're very beautiful birds and they always like to look perfect. 
I think they're rather vain and they don't want to look, they, they don't want to look bad to anybody, uh, especially to other birds. So when they are going to bathe, here's one of their habits. They come up to the water like this and they look around. They don't just jump into the bath. And so they look around and they're making sure nobody's watching. And then they'll actually stand in the water, but not get wet. They'll stand there and keep checking. And this bird's looking back at me to see what I'm doing. He knows I'm there. And I don't know that they know what a camera is, but um, he's just checking to make sure that he's not going to look bad in front of me or anybody else. But what they do is they, once the coast is clear, they jump in, they splash very fast. This is two shots. And then they jump out. And this is what they look like when they jump out. And nobody sees that normally because as soon as they pop up like that, they fly away into the brush to go dry off and become presentable again. So those, those three pictures are very unusual. I have very few bathing green jay pictures and they're very special to me. Here's one that didn't fly off into the brush and he, he uh, chose to go right there and shake off. I used a longer shutter speed to get the, the water spraying. You have to think very fast when you're doing action like this. Here's a dry green jay. He's missing part of his tail feathers. And to me, he sort of looks embarrassed. He's, he's facing away from the camera, but uh, turned around for just a second. Here's one that landed on one of my perches that was meant for a titmouse or a small bird. And he's much heavier. And so when he landed, he had one foot on each part of the branches and uh, balanced precariously and then jumped down because he realized this, this is too small. It doesn't fit. So sometimes you can get funny pictures. They're unexpected and funny. I really wasn't expecting a green jay. And when I saw him coming down, I, I was ready. I was ready for a small bird and uh, he barely fit in the frame. You can see if there was a bird half his size that it would fit better. Sometimes you have a standoff. And like I said before, the green jays are not really uh, berry pickers or choose berries as their first food, uh, you know, their favorite food. But uh, when you have two green jays in one spot, a lot of times they're going to vie for the best position. And that's what's going on here. Here's a green jay coming into a perch that I've loaded some berries, a, a branch of berries on. And uh, he's not going to eat the berries. Uh, sometimes they do. And I've, I've occasionally got pictures of green jays with berries. Here's one right now. And I just got lucky on that. I, I had a really nice uh, yopan berry perch. I had it hanging down. The distant background is all soft and, and uh, really not very uh, detailed at all. And so it just really highlights the bird. So that's, that's one of my uh, favorite green jays with red berries because they don't eat them very often. So just for fun, uh, I'm going to go through the rest of these pictures and Linda might have to stop me because I put way too many to talk about individually. But at this point, I'll start showing pictures and I'm just going to scroll through them and maybe make a comment or two and just hope you enjoy them because I love having fun with birds and I do things to uh, help me get funny pictures in, in, instead of just the usual. So I set up a camera outside the photo blind and this Cardinal was very curious about the camera. And uh, I thought she wanted to be a photographer maybe. There she is up on top of the camera. There's the male. And what I was hoping to do was that one of the birds would land on that perch right in front of the camera. I've got a super short lens on the camera and focused on that perch, but um, really I didn't take any pictures like that. I didn't have a trigger to, uh, to uh, trip the camera if the birds did what I wanted. What I was hoping was that the female cardinal would land on top of the camera and the male would be uh, posing for her. <laughs> Here's a Pyroloxia. I had left my shovel outside the photo blind by accident and the Pyroloxia landed on it. Here you've got a discussion going on between the female Pyroloxia on the left and the male. He came in and sort of pushed his way into her space and she didn't like it. 
Here's a female cardinal bending down to eat the red berries. Generally speaking, if you've got red berries, you're going to get cardinals. This isn't a red berry, but it's a Tassajillo cactus. And this Pyroloxia came and ate every single red uh, fruit from that Tassajillo cactus facing away from me. And I was so frustrated because like, how do you get him to face you? And when he took the last one, he looked over his shoulder, sort of like Marilyn Monroe almost, right? And uh, it just made me up, it made me crack up because he was uh, basically doing the splits and giving me a look. Here's another Pyroloxia flying in. Love those wings and the tail position. There's a cardinal that stopped by my uh, vertical hanging branch and uh, he, he landed there, but then he flew right away. There's a female cardinal coming into the cactus. Another male cardinal coming to the cactus. And another one, I have lots and lots of cardinal pictures. There he is landing on the tuna, which is the fruit of the cactus. And he was balancing on one foot. And I love the position of the foot, the, well, both feet, the wings, the tail, and then the expression. And he's got his crest up. I have a cardinal rule, crest up, tail down. You'll rarely see me take a picture of a cardinal unless the crest is up and the tail is down. This one is for Valentine's Day. You can see the heart-shaped cactus and he landed on it. Now this one is opposite. It's crest up, but the tail is up. So that's uh, one time when I allow the cardinals to break the rule. Uh, I love upside down birds. You saw the upside down green jay. Well, here's an upside down cardinal. In springtime, the male cardinals love to feed the females because they're all vying for her attention. And she'll accept food from the one that she wants to be her mate. And that's what's happening here. There's a cardinal shaking off. Another one landing on a perch, flared out. And another one getting ready to take off. Way too many cardinals and pyroloxias, right? This pyroloxia was in my backyard and I got it to land on that perch. Let's move on to other birds. We've got a a buff-bellied hummingbird coming into the red sage. And that's a, um, a natural background. I use multiple flash uh, to get the bird lit all the way around. Here's a painted bunting male on the cattail. Natural backgrounds. All of my backgrounds are natural. If there are a few in here that are not, I will mention it. This is a uh, sparrow, the black-throated sparrow perching on the cactus. Here we've got a bird. I, I love the composition on this. The only thing I don't like about this, and I could fix it, would be on the top right hand side of the vertical edge. There are those uh, leaves poking into the composition. I wish I had included the whole uh, right side of that perch. And I know I could clone it out. I don't like spending lots of time on the computer. Uh, working on pictures. So this Lincoln Sparrow just um, had to have that little bit of greenery in the, in the picture. This is on my business card. It's a chestnut sided warbler. And usually they're tall, but small uh, birds that are very perky and, and uh, energetic. And this guy was on South Padre Island as he was uh, migrating North and he just let everything loose and just sort of hung out <coughs> and was and the, uh, the wind puffed behind him and poofed out his feathers. Here we've got a black crested titmouse. Here we have a white-eyed vireo, and that's a very light colored bird with white eyes. And I love where it perched. Some people might not like that perch, that, the, the branch that goes right above its head, neck, and back, but it follows the shape of the bird. And sure, I could clone it out or fix it, but, I just, um, I like the high key effect that this bird had. He landed in a, in a light area with a light background. So I let uh, composition work its way that way. Not too often do you get a common ground dove to land up in a tree. They spend most of their time on the ground, but I put this perch up in my yard. Actually, it was a tree branch and um, it landed there for me. I was just really excited because you don't get them off the ground much. 
Here we have a white crown sparrow. This is sort of a messy composition, but I think it's just uh, sort of natural looking. These, these uh, flowers grow in the grasses and they go up on uh, onto dead snags and things like that. So some people might think it's not a real clean looking picture, but I like the natural look to it. It's sort of like if you were doing a painting, um, the artist might do something like that. Here's an orange crowned warbler. You don't see the orange crown, but uh, whenever the cactus has uh, fruits on it, the birds all love it. You can see the hole pecked in the front side of the, the left tuna, and he's sitting on top of the right one and eating from it. Uh, all the wildlife that eat the, the uh, cactus tunas end up with purple faces. It sort of reminds me of uh, little kids with popsicles. Here you have a, an unusual view of an olive sparrow. It's an endemic to South Texas. You won't find this bird anywhere else in the United States. And what you're seeing is one of the field marks that you don't see. They have a little bit of yellow, just a smudge of yellow under their wing. And when they're just walking around or are coming to eat or drink, you don't see that. But this one had its uh, wing and tail feathers all flared out. So you get to see uh, something that you don't normally see on a on an olive sparrow. We've got a blue grosbeak. He was super close, and so I uh, couldn't get the whole body in because I had a long lens. So I just cropped. Well, I didn't crop. He was just super close. There's a woodpecker. It was hanging upside down from this perch, and this bee happened to fly by right when he. I think he was watching. Or she. That's a she. It's a golden fronted woodpecker female, and she's watching the bee as it goes by. There's the male. He's got his tongue out. I try and capture things that you don't normally see. Here's a pair of golden fronted woodpeckers. And I set up this perch. Well, it's not a perch. It's an old stump and planted a bunch of grass around it. And the woodpeckers came as a pair to inspect the, um, inspect the perch. There's one flying. Here's a case of having too much lens. Usually when people are photographing birds, they always want a longer lens. Well, the, the uh, great Kiskadee on the right-hand side had been perched on this perch that was overlooking the, the pond on the ranch. It went fishing. And when it came back, this golden fronted woodpecker was there where it had been perched. And so they had a, he had a surprise and uh, she didn't like him coming into what she considered her perch. Here's a kiskity eating a bug. It picked it up out of the water. They play with their food. They love red berries. So there's some yopan, this green, the, not green jay, sorry. They love yopan. And so this greedy great kiskity plucked two berries off the perch, but it couldn't hold them both. And so I got a picture since I was shooting a series, it dropped the second berry. It's even making a shadow on its throat. Here's one flying away with a berry. There's one with the yellow crest. You don't normally see that unless they uh, raise the crest or are staring straight at you or are angry, you know, when they're fighting with another bird. There it is again, showing a little bit. We've got a long-billed thrasher drinking. Nice reflection. I went vertical for that, even though it's a horizontal type bird usually. The Northern Mockingbird is the state bird of, bird of Texas. I caught him flying. When I'm doing these flight shots, I want 25 hundredths of a second shutter speed if possible. This is a uh, great-tailed grackle female gathering nesting material at the edge of the pond. There's another black bird. I call this one Darth Vader because of the, the black body and the red eyes, but it's uh, really not. Um, Oh gosh, here's my age showing. What is his name? He is, he's in the blackbird family. It's a cowbird. That's the uh, bronzed cowbird. He hovers over the intended mate. So I caught him hovering over a female. She was too far below him for me to get her in the picture. Here we've got some red winged blackbirds. These are females. They look like giant sparrows, but if you look at the wings on the top bird, you'll see that this is a young male, uh, a juvenile. Here we have some more 
Audubon's Orioles. They look good with the yellow flowers. I love using natural flowers from the uh, from the ranch when I'm photographing. Here's one with Yopan. They love those berries. There's one looking down. Another one looking down on the same perch. Here we have a groove build Ani. And those are the funniest looking birds. And they don't generally have their tails up above their head, but this one, the wind caught and you can see the wind is blowing its feathers also. This is um, a Costa Rica bird and I've got it close and closer. I just love the curly hairdo. Here we're back to some quail. There's the female. They're generally a ground bird, but if you put up a perch, you can sometimes get them like that. Here's a family of quail coming to the water to drink. There are two females having a little uh, square off. There's a dad with his chick. This is really good for Father's Day, right? There's one walking through the grass looking to make sure everything's okay for his family. There's another one with his family in a different place. There's dad at the lead and mom at the rear with the chicks in between. These are half grown uh, females drinking. There's some babies at the water. Now we move into the turkeys. I love catching action shots with turkeys because they're, they're big and they make great pictures. This one just took a dirt bath. And if you look on the right side, you can see a big dirt clod flying off of her. She uh, laid down in the, uh, in the dirt, gathered lots of dirt, wallowing around in it, and then stood up and shook off. It's quite a show. Here's some chachalacas, plain chachalacas. A yellow-billed cuckoo. You can see something in each of these pictures. There's something happening that's not just a bird standing there or sitting there. This this is a uh, roadrunner, greater roadrunner, and he's twisted all around showing his colorful tail feathers that if the sun was shining, they'd be brilliant rainbow colors, but it was an overcast day. But he's grooming and he contorted himself into that position. Here's one with a mouse. There's one with a bee. It was playing with the bee before it uh, squished it. I wanted to make sure it was dead so it wouldn't sting him. Here's one with a rock. I got several pictures of that, but I only put two in. Here's the first shot with a profile with the rock. And here he is playing with the rock coming towards the camera too close for me to get the whole bird in. There's one drinking. This is a, a kingbird, a couch's kingbird, I think. Uh, splashing through the water. I love getting birds in the water. Here's a scissor tail flycatcher flying through uh, the air, doing a belly flop in the water and then coming up out and taking water with it. Meadowlark taking a bath. Oh, which bird is this? Um, plover? Sandpiper. Anyway, it's got its little food. There's a roseate spoonbill, not a flamingo. And here we have whooping cranes with crabs. I'm just going to start going faster because I know that I can just keep on going with these pictures. Uh, lots and lots of pictures. These are all birds. This is out at Bosque de la Pache. So is that. Here's a, uh, not a cormorant, um, and Hinga came to the ranch. A reddish egret a white morph of the reddish egret. This is a uh, captive eagle. He doesn't have a complete wing, and so he's captive. So I always like to say when I've photographed a captive subject. Here's an eagle at uh, Bosque del Apache in the big tree by the water. Now I've got some crested caracaras. I do lots of crested caracaras because they are so much fun. And I'm just going to fly through these literally. Um, I, I love doing caracaras. They're just so fun to photograph because they're funny. This one on the, the left looks like it's kicking the other one and the other one's trying to catch its balance. They kick each other. Here's a young Harris's hawk with a coral snake. 
A, a, this is a crested caracara, and it's a road-killed coyote. And he landed there, but he's not sure if this coyote is sleeping or playing dead. So he's reaching out to touch it. And this is another young caracara. They don't have the brilliant colors that the, uh, the adults do, but he's doing that territorial posture of tossing his head over its back. There's another one on a dead armadillo. I don't kill animals to get pictures, but I will pick up clean roadkill. I call it clean because there's no blood, no guts showing. They're just dead animals on the road. And what I'm, what I believe I'm doing is helping these animals, um, the, the birds not get hit by cars because so many times the raptors that eat roadkill get killed because they're on the road. So I feel like I'm doing um, a favor to the birds and giving me opportunities to take pictures. Here's a juvenile on the right and an adult on the left. And the juvenile kept poking at the adult and the adult finally just said, I'm out of here and left. Here's uh, Harris's hawk kicking the other one. And uh, it, it's a game of uh, get even because the one that's getting kicked is also biting the one that's leaving. Here's a frugianus pygmyal. He was stretching. It looks like little angel wings. This is a captive bird. He has a um, missing wing. He's in captivity and he's at a nature center. There's an owl. This is a barn owl. And he's bringing a decapitated rat to his nest. This is a night shot set up with um, a laser beam. He breaks the beam and uh, gets his picture taken. This was in my backyard. It's a Texas tortoise. There's one eating some greenery. This was right in front of the photo blind. I had to use a shorter lens to get it. He was so close. And there's one eating dirt. They eat the dirt to get the minerals. You learn so much just from being out there, spending time outdoors, watching and paying attention. I am not uh, one who likes to check animals or birds off a list and keep on moving. I like to sit and watch and see what's going to happen next. The first time I saw a tortoise eating dirt, I had no idea what was going on. So then you go and find out. This is uh, little Buddy. He's a cooter turtle at the Laguna Seca Ranch. And sometimes he takes a sun bath. And I just, I was able to get this picture. This is in my backyard. So here are your snakes. Whoever's afraid of snakes, you might go get a drink of water. I just have maybe a few. This is a checkered garter snake um, going through my yard. I love the red tongue. Here's a rattlesnake just slithering across the uh, scene in front of the photo blind. There's one coiled and you can't see the rattle, but you can see the tongue very sharply. This is from above. I'm using a short lens and standing above. I'm wearing snake boots and I've got a friend in front of the snake keeping the snake's attention off of me. I don't think the snake even knew I was there. The picture you saw earlier with me behind the plexiglass, this is the photo that I was taking. This is the close up. This is the scene. This is an old picture with film long, long, long time ago. This was in uh, 2000 and it was uh, a small rattlesnake and a green anole. Anoles and other lizards are afraid of snakes because many snakes eat lizards, but rattlesnakes don't. They're uh, in the viper family and they have heat sensors in their faces to tell them that there's something warm blooded in front of them. So for the rattlesnake, this anole did not register as food. It was just sitting there and not doing anything. And after a few seconds, the uh, anole got brave or afraid. I'm not sure which, but he let go and ran and the snake just sat there. So all, end, all ended well. No animals were harmed. Uh, here we've got an alligator. Just um, This is the view that you might get when you come up on the scene. But if you can, if you can get down low and closer, and by closer, I don't necessarily mean physically closer, use your lens, use a longer lens, back off and squat down and it will give the appearance that you're closer. You can make your pictures look however you want, depending on what lens, uh, what equipment and what perspective you take. I love doing action shots 
And so I put up a stick for the dragonflies to land on. They love landing on little sticks near the water. And this one, if you look very closely, you can see it's got a leaf hopper in its mouth and it's about to land. I pre-focused on that stick on the end of it and got that picture like that. There's an unusual shot of a, a, a bluet landing on the wasp that's floating in the water and drinking. And there's the wasp lifting off. It's a different wasp, a different day, but it's the same, same place. Spiders, I love doing spiders in their webs. And you don't have to have the web all focused. If your attention is going to the spider, you don't need the web to be in close focus uh, or perfect focus on the whole web, just where the spider is. This is sort of a camouflage. It's, it looks like a piece of grass, but it's really a walking stick. It's got both of its front legs out and the antennas forward. This is the bottom side of a caterpillar on a piece of grass going vertically. When people see these, they always ask, aren't those dangerous? No, it's not a centipede, it's a millipede. Millipedes have lots more legs and they eat leaf litter. So they're very innocuous. If you touch them, they curl up and you can get a good picture like this. This is a red velvet mite. And I think that's the last picture in, in oh no, got a couple of butterflies. That's right. Um, the insect world. And so that's a freshly emerged butterfly. You can see the chrysalis down below and the shed skin from below that. Uh, sort of unusual to get all of that in one shot. That's this is my last butterfly shot, I think. Nope, I'm wrong. I have four uh, swallowtails and they were all doing what's called puddling. They, the damp uh, sand has minerals in it and they're taking the minerals from the sand. Here we've got a bee in the picture, a side view, completely different uh, view of the same kind of butterfly in the same sand. So I've got some mammals for you. I love bobcats. This one is stretching. This one's a youngster coming across the field at the Laguna Seca Ranch. This one showed up in July a few years ago, and I had my 500 millimeter lens on, couldn't fit the whole face of the cat in the picture. So I took the top half of the face and the bottom half several times back and forth, you know, up and down, getting, getting the picture. And then later in Photoshop, I had Photoshop stitch it together to make one picture. I don't do this often. I don't play very much in the computer, but this picture was so valuable to me because I had not gotten that close to a, a bobcat for facial pictures like that. And once I had those pictures, then I changed to the 70 to 200 millimeter lens and was able to swap uh, lenses and get pictures of the whole cat. You can see it's a young cat. It's long and tall and thin. This was an opportunity, unexpected. You always have to be ready. You never know what you're gonna find. I always carry a full pack in my car or truck when I'm traveling or, or shooting. And um, this badger and its babies were on the road. And when they saw the car coming, mama scooted them off to the side of the road and went in the vegetation. So we all got out, took a few quick pictures. I used my macro lens and then left to leave them in peace. This is a pocket gopher and he's digging dirt. Whenever it rains, their burrows get filled with water and they just turn into little, um, uh, I'm gonna say bulldozers. And so this one is uh, shoveling dirt. This one came out and uh, I put that flower there. So I did stage this, but it pulled the flower down with it. <laughs> it went, it took the flower to decorate its, uh, its burrow. And actually I think it ate the flower, but I like to say decorate. Okay, I've got a cottontail rabbit and I was taking pictures of it and uh, something startled it and it jumped forward and I just happened to be ready. I was really lucky on that. An armadillo loves to wallow in the water. And that's what happened here. This one wallowed in the water and then came out and uh, showed us what it looked like. Havelina up close. He heard something and turned his head and picked up a foot. There's one smelling something up above it. And here's one with its baby. 
Thank you so much. I'm going to ask if anybody has questions and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I have some questions for you. All right. Um, let's start with um, just because it was just on the screen. Um, Susan's curious, where was the badger? Laguna Seca Ranch. Okay. Um, so you've mentioned Laguna Seca several times. Can you just give people, there are a lot of people in the room that are not from Texas. So can you just kind of give them a little, where they kind of, a, where would you pin in on the map? Where are you? Okay, I'm putting the website in the chat right now, lagunasecaranch.com, very easy to remember. And uh, you can check out the, the ranch. I'll give it a little plug right now. I've been working with this ranch for, oh, I don't know how many years. I've been here in the Valley for 20 something years, so probably 15 or more. Anyway, um, if you go to lagunasecaranch.com, you can read all about the ranch and its history and what we do. We've got three morning blinds, two evening blinds, and one of the morning blinds is a raptor blind. That's where I got all those crested caracara pictures. Um, I'm a guide there. I've been there forever. And um, just you can contact the ranch directly. If you contact me, that's okay. But I'm still going to have to uh, correspond with the ranch. I can see the calendar. So if you want to ask me if there's room, I can tell you, yes, there is or no, there isn't. Um, but you'll need to make contact with the ranch owner and please say that you talked to me and would like me as your guide. Otherwise you might, you won't know who you're going to get as a guide. There are only a couple of us, but um, I'm, I'm the one who does most of the guiding there. We do have workshops there. Um, I don't know. It's a wonderful place to photograph. I love going there. Okay. Thanks. Um, Kimberly's asking, um, do you always shoot your birds from bird blind? No, um, I do like to walk around and take pictures or drive around your, your vehicle. My truck uh, makes a wonderful um, blind. And so you can drive around, you can walk around. When I'm walking around, I find that I don't get all the really cool types of pictures that I do. I like to shoot, well, I like to photograph pretty much anything in front of me if it's natural. Um, but I, I, uh, I have to say, I find that I have better luck from in the blind because you're stationary, you're hidden. The birds are very natural. They're accustomed to coming there to drink, bathe, eat, and do what birds do. Um, sometimes you get wildlife besides birds. And I always treasure those moments. You never know what's going to show up, but, um, I'm mostly, uh, a photo blind user. If I go out walking well i i carry a, a a temporary blind it's just like a throw over that i can cover myself with but if you're walking around at a nature park or a national wildlife refuge it looks sort of funny when you do that and um i i like to hike the trails but most of the time when i'm guiding photographers i'm in a photo blind situation okay so there's a um... I'm going to try to get this right. There's quite a few questions and um, it's, it's about um, your lens. Um, the first question is why don't you use zoom lenses? Um, and then what's your perspective or her, or your preference a fixed lens versus a fixed lens length versus a telephoto? Do you want to? Okay. I'll, I'll just, Try and be really quick about that. I started photographing back in the 80s and zoom lenses, when they had zoom lenses, they were not sharp, they were dark, they were slow. And I found that I just, I didn't get good pictures. And so I had an aversion to zoom lenses. And when I took classes in college, um, I got the same thing from the professor. So I, you know, my lenses back then, in my early Nikon days, I had a Nikon F3. And I had a 20 millimeter, a 50 millimeter. I had a 70 to 210, which I got rid of after six months. I didn't like that. And uh, um, a 200 millimeter macro lens, a 300 millimeter, and then a 600 millimeter. So I got used to knowing what lens to pick up for whatever I was photographing. And back then I really didn't do birds. I, I learned birds um, as, I, as I went. So it's it's just habit that I'm used to picking a focal length and sticking with it. Now I'm, I've, I've got some zoom lenses and I'm trying to adapt to that. I've, 
I, I have to say, I still lean toward my, I love my 600 millimeter F4 lens, but it is super heavy. That lens is about 30 years old. And I think I've carried it around long enough that uh, that one's not an icon. That's my, that's my Canon gear. So I have a 300 millimeter F 2.8 and a 600 millimeter F4. And since I switched to mirrorless, I got, I sold my 100 to 400 millimeter lens and bought the mirrorless lens, the 100 to 500. That's what I'm shooting with currently, but I'm still always looking to lighten my load. And that 600 millimeter lens weighs about 15 pounds plus the camera weighs about four. And well, I've got plates on it and stuff. So I'm probably carrying, you know, 20, 20 pounds just with the one lens. Um, <laughs> um, so Holly has a question in here. Um, first of all, she says, all your photos are amazing, but she can't seem to get that beautiful bokeh that you're getting. Do you have any tips for her? I do. If you're using a zoom lens, I didn't mention that, but zoom lenses tend to not have the beautiful bokeh. So with my 600 millimeter F4, even if I stop down and my distance to the background is any more than just a few feet, you're going to get that. So if you're focused, if you're using a zoom lens and your distance from the bird to the background is close or not far away, you're not going to get that bokeh. Okay. The 300 28 is the same way. The 600 millimeter F4, you probably couldn't bring in a sharp background if you tried. But um, the 300 millimeter F2.8 is the same thing. You just get really soft backgrounds with those fixed focal lengths in the super telephotos. Um, yeah, she says she uses a 100 to 400 almost. Every okay, time. so if, if that sounds like a Canon, because Canon has 100 to 400. If that's the case, I would always be shooting at 400 millimeters and do not stop down very much. You know, I, I like to use uh, 6.1, 7.3, 8. You know, I, I like to keep it. I don't like to stop down to 11 or 16. It just that just brings your background in uh, tighter uh, or or more sharply focused. And so on on the the 100 to 400, if you're at the 400 end of the zoom, you're going to have better luck. Um, if you're only shooting at 5.6 though, which is what that lens does, maximum aperture, you you might have the head and eye in focus, but the tail or wings might be out. So um, working, working on a, a zoom, that's going to be difficult. Um, this is goes to your settings. So the first question is, Carol, what lens and settings do you normally shoot with? And then on, on average, how far away are you from the perches that you're setting up? Okay. I'll talk about Canon cause I'm, I'm shooting other stuff too now, but, um, with my Canon, I'm using the R5 mirrorless camera. My first choice is the 600 millimeter lens. It's an F4 and I'm shooting, you can't focus close on that. That lens, I think you have to be 13 feet away or more. And so, um, that's my first choice. If that's too close, um, I switch to my 300 millimeter F 2.8 and I'll put a 1.4 X teleconverter, which makes it 420 millimeters. And so that's, that's the compromise. It focuses a little bit closer. So um, settings, I try and keep, uh, you know, to the six point to seven point, maybe up to eight point uh, F stop the aperture, but I don't, I don't like having, I like the bokeh. I like the soft bokeh. So I, I steer away from stopping the lens down too much. What I what I do is set my shutter speed first. I've got it set for my camera. When I turn it on, the shutter speed is at 2,500th of a second. The aperture is at F8 and the ISO is at a, a 800. If I need to change anything to get my exposure right, the first thing I'll do, I never touch the 2,500 because that's what I want. Unless I'm working in super low light, then it's a compromise but I generally shoot at 25 hundredth of a second. If I don't have enough light to capture the, tw the, the, the shutter speed like that, the first thing I'll do is double my ISO. I have my ISO set on my cameras so that it doubles. I have 100, 200, 400, 800, 
1600, 3200. So if it doesn't work at F, uh, the, at ISO 800, I jump to 1600. If that doesn't work, I go to 3200. And then I can open up my aperture a little bit too. We always fight, fight having enough light. Right. So, so you've, you've listed your settings. So this is to add to Maria's question. Um, you got sunny, you got versus a cloudy day and you know, that things change. Um, she's curious about what do you find most effective for a flight shot? You mean the, the, the white balance or, well, I think it's, it goes back to the settings. Would you change your, your shutter speed? Would you move it a little no. faster? Okay. If you want, if you want flight shots, you've got to have 25 hundredths. Uh, smaller birds could even use, you know, four thousandths of a second. Bigger birds, you could probably get by with two thousandths of a second. I don't sacrifice my shutter speed to get a picture. I generally try and keep it at 2,500 and then adjust the ISO and the aperture. I do not shoot on auto ISO because I like to know what I'm doing and what my camera's doing. I don't like the camera to make that decision for me. So I, I typically um, make those adjustments myself. And as for white balance, I leave it on auto white balance because I know I can work on that in the computer if I want. Okay. Um, the next question, and I, I'm sorry, I should have looked this up for you, Joe. Um, she's curious about how do you set up your branches for the birds to come to? And let me, before you answer that, real, sh um, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, plug, if you will go to the happiness hour where you signed in and just do a search for Ruth's name, she actually did a presentation, an entire presentation on setting up your backyard. Um, and you covered, the suet and a recipe and the perches, but um, for sake of her question, do you want to answer that for her, Ruth? Yep. I'll be really quick. First, I do the perch search. That's looking for perches that look natural. And if it's something that blooms, I want to put it in water so that it doesn't droop. I hate droopy perches, you know, droopy flowers. They look staged and like a haphazard uh, attempt at getting great pictures. So I'm very particular about my perches. I'm very particular about food not showing in the pictures. I don't think you saw any food in any of those pictures. And there may or may not have been because the birds come down anyway, because they're curious. They know that um, they might get a treat. So I use suet. The, the, the suet recipe is in that. Um, I'm sure I shared that suet recipe yes. in the, uh, in that, happiness hour, but it's uh, four different ingredients. It's uh, smooth peanut butter, white lard, flour, and cornmeal. And you can, you can read about it or watch that happiness hour. Yeah. Um, okay. Quick question. Cause John's question came after we stopped talking about Laguna Seca quick. Uh, when's a good time of the year to visit that ranch? Oh my gosh. I'm going to just say all times of the year are good, except probably uh, if you want birds, probably not July because that's when they're molting July and August and into September, but you can get bobcat pictures. I mean, everything has to drink. You get the mammals and all that. It's always a good time to go to the ranch or pretty much any of the photo ranches. So it, the winter is the great time for the, the Caracaras, the Harris's hawks, the vultures. Um, the owls. I mean, it, winter time is a great time to get those birds. In the springtime, when you want to get the painted bunting, you're not going to get the caracara because the caracaras are on the nest when the painted buntings arrive in mid-April. Um, I'm going to say March, April, and May are the migration months. That's when you see the biggest variety in fr from day to day. We always have a good variety of birds. Even in the winter, you know, you don't... It, we have some birds that migrate south, but we get birds that migrate to us from the north. So we get birds in the winter that we don't have uh, in the summer. So it, it, it's, it's always changing from one week to the next. Okay. All right. This is going to be your last question because I want to wrap up the session. Um, Jamie, it's a great question, which is why I held it, Jamie. Her question is, how do you recommend researching subjects that you won't have a prolonged period of time to interact with. For example, going to Yellowstone or Teton um, for a shoot, but you don't know what wildlife you're gonna encounter. 
Oh, there's all kinds of field guides that will say, you know, the birds of Arizona or the the wildlife at Yellowstone. There there are so many good good books out there. And um for myself, I mean, I don't when I'm going someplace where I haven't been, I do like to know a little bit of a heads up of what I could see. But I have to admit, I don't follow my own advice that I just gave. I don't go out and buy a whole lot of field guides, but I do try and get on. Um, I'll go on the internet and do some research there uh, to see what I can expect. I just, um, I'm I'm always on the go and I find it hard to uh, to plan time to read books, but they really do tell you a lot. Um, the field guides, look for the field guides of the place you're going to go. Like if you're going to go to Yellowstone, there are so many field guides. When you go to their library or their bookstore, uh, the gift shop, they've just got walls full of books, just wanting people to buy them. And they're all good. You just can't buy them all. All right. I think I got everything. There might've been one that slipped in, but I'm going to go ahead and, um, close out the session for tonight. Ruth, thank you so much for coming back again and again. I love coming to help you. I'll get you too. I'm sorry. I said, I'll get you too. You're going to have to come down and do a presentation for our group down here. Well, it doesn't work that way. You know, that doesn't work that way, but you know what? Can can I, can I make one plug for TechSnap? Yes, please. Okay. So um, I founded a group back in July of 2001. It's called TechSnep, T-E-X-N-E-P. And the website is tex-nep.org. We have a monthly meeting and we are going back to live in-person meetings. Uh, We usually meet the third Thursday of the month. And this month I was out of town last week. So um, tomorrow night, we are having our first in-person meeting. We are going to have a um, a Zoom set up so that people who can't come can still come. And we're going to be talking about what we're going to do. We're looking for a place to meet permanently. We've got a temporary spot tomorrow night just to get us going. But I, I'm so looking forward to getting this group back together. We're going to have a field trip on Saturday morning. And so tomorrow night is our first time since the pandemic started. Yay. Um, I oh, you, probably need, you probably need to know how to get in touch with us. Mm. Uh, look at the website. I'll put the website in the chat. Let me do that real quick. Sorry about it. that. Yeah, and go ahead and say it out loud. So if anybody's watching, they will be able, they won't see the chat, but it's techsnep.org. Right. And when we redid our website, um, we couldn't get our original, uh, our original site. So it's T. E-X for Texas dash N-E-P dot org. And it's um it's a great place to uh to meet. Okay. Oh right. somebody Rose Mark uh somebody put it in there. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks, you, Rose. All right. With that, I'm gonna shut down this session. Uh, you can connect with Ruth through her Instagram at Ruth Hoyt Photo. And her website, which, by the way, someone mentioned they went to look and there's not a lot of workshops listed. So you might want to update that, Ruth. But you can check out her. You can also connect with her through her website at ruthhoyt.com. Next week, Egidio Latau will join us to share his presentation, Travel in Nature, My Ongoing Journey in Photography. Until next time, go out and create something beautiful. And I hope that we see you again soon.